Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Good morning and welcome to Christ Temple Church. We are a Christ-centered church connecting people to Jesus and to one another. And we hope our ministry and message encourages you to love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. To our members, let's remember to give our tithes and offering. And again, you can do that one of several ways. You can go to ChristTempleLA.org. PayPal. You can drop off here at the church and you can also use the mobile app Venmo where our username is at Christ Temple LA. Please tell a friend to join us for Sunday school at 930 and remember that our Wednesday night conference call begins at 630. Our return date for in-person worship here at Christ Temple is Father's Day, Sunday, June the 20th. That service will start a little earlier at 1030, and we will follow all the necessary health protocols to keep everyone safe. Uh, one additional announcement, the Western and the Pacific Northwestern virtual convention is Saturday, June 26th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Here's the Zoom information. The number is 646 558 8656. Again, that's 646 558 8656. The meeting ID is 444 375 3175. I'll, I'll say that again. The meeting ID is 444 375 3175. Seven, five. Today the speaker is our very own pastor, Bishop Lindsay. Up next we'll have a musical selection and after that the, the sermon. And after the sermon we will um, be observing communion. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your kindness and your goodness and your mercy. We thank you for being our Father. And we pray that through the message and through the ministry of music you would encourage our hearts, strengthen us, keep us, instruct us, challenge us, confront us. Lord, give us what we stand in need of. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. from 
morning. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Soon and very soon, I say to the Christ Temple Church family and friends that we will be back meeting in person. We hope to be in the auditorium on uh, June the 20th. And uh, I trust that you'll be in attendance and be in prayer for us as we um, plan to gather again after um, almost a year and a half. We have been separated and we look forward to our fellowship and corporate worship. This morning, I'd like to invite you to take your Bible and come with me to Genesis chapter 3, the very first book in the Bible. The book of the beginnings, the beginnings of the blessing of God, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said unto him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat all the days of your life. Then will I put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head. Head, and you shall bruise his heel. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? What is this that thou hast done? 
We seem to be living in a time of one crisis, one catastrophe, one challenge after the other. If there is not a mass shooting somewhere where innocent people are shot down, we're in the midst of a racial crisis, a political crisis, or even the weather appears to have gone crazy and is out of control. As this pandemic is winding down in America, other parts of the world are on fire with illness and sickness and death and disease. Cyber criminals are now at working, attacking the infrastructure of America, disrupting our way of life. People are calling us every day, emailing us, trying to steal our few resources that we have through fraud and scams and con artists at work over time, 24-7. This is the world in which we live, where there is an avalanche of evil and wickedness and corruption and sin all around us. Every day when I leave my home and go into the busy streets of this city, my ears are exalted by the profanity and by the lyrics of the various songs that are being sung so very loudly on our highways and byways. We are confused about our sexuality. Men desire to be women, women desire to be men, and some don't know what they want to be. I was driving down the Slauson the other day, and as I was driving down the street and passing one of the bus stops, I looked over to my right, and there was somebody bending over at the bus stop, and lo and behold, I was looking at their underwear, and I said, what in the world is going on? All of this exposure, we live in a world that's gone mad. Our women are more exposed than they have ever been. Our marriages have become battlegrounds. Divorce seems to be the order of the day and the only option for so many. Crime, violence, oppression, Wars among nations, poverty, hunger, homelessness. Indeed, they all seem to be the order of our times. It makes me recall the hit song by Marvin Gaye. Tell me, what's going on? What's going on? This avalanche of sin and wickedness and corruption. We are inundated on every side. Tell me what's going on. Please come with me this morning to Genesis chapter three, the very first book in the Bible. Perhaps we can receive some insight for the time in which we live. In Genesis chapter one and two, the very first book of the Bible in these first two chapters, the Bible opens with the fact that God is. The Bible never explains God. It just says, in the beginning, God. And the God that we discover in his word, or through his word, this God has created the world in all of its glory and beauty. Everything has been created by God and set in order, and God has pronounced it good and blessed it. God has created in the midst of his creation, this perfect place, this wonderful place called the Garden of Eden, a wonderful garden where all things are pure and perfect. And the crowning work of God's creation was the creation of man, man whom God labored over and God breathed into this man the breath of life and he becomes a 
living soul, given the responsibility of tending to this wonderful garden and naming the animals that were a part of God's creation. God saw that man was lonely and because man was alone, God knew that man needed a companion. And so God created woman. He put Adam to sleep and from his side, he made another living creature called woman, a perfect companion for man. And there they dwell in this beautiful garden that our God has created with perfect harmony and unity and oneness. They are naked and not ashamed, both man and woman. There is no self-consciousness, but they're in this perfect relationship, one with the other and also with the God of the universe. They were in communion with this great God who comes down in the cool of the evening and they walk together and talk together and enjoy such fellowship. They knew God as he is. Man was alive in every sense of the word. Man was alive in his innermost being, in his very soul. Indeed, he was experiencing what Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Man was experiencing a fullness of life, a quality of life that can only be known as we are in fellowship with our God. A few moments ago, I was talking about all those negative things, all of that sin, corruption, uncleanness, and impurity that characterize our world now, but none of that was happening. It was a wonderful existence that Adam and Eve and God knew in the garden, in the beginning. A perfect place, filled with perfect peace, filled with a perfect relationship, with the God of all creation. Then something happened. Something happened whereby God asked the question, what is this that thou has done? Something happened to destroy the peace, the joy, the beauty, the blessing of the beginning. In chapter 3, into this perfect place comes this animal who is more cunning than all the creatures that God has made. The serpent. Oh, he's slick. He is so slick. And he has a bone to pick with the true and living God. And he decides to strike at God by going through Eve. He sees Adam and Eve in the garden enjoying this perfect place, a place of pure bliss and happiness and fulfillment and joy. He comes to Eve and he begins to question what God has said to her. Did God say that you're not to eat of any of the fruit of the trees of the garden Eve? in the Garden of Eden. Satan begins her, uh, his attack by working on Sister Eve. And he wants Eve to doubt God's goodness. He wants Eve to begin to question, is not God holding something back? Is not God holding on to something just for himself that you cannot experience? What kind of God would create all of this and then not allow you to enjoy it in its fullness? He couldn't be a very good God. This is the serpent's line of attack and line of reasoning. And Eve responds correctly. She says to the serpent that God told them to eat of every tree and to enjoy the fruit thereof except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Eve does not stop with what God has said. Eve goes on to say, God said, don't touch it or we die. But the serpent and the serpent, the serpent is really 
Satan, who has camouflaged himself as a serpent, he responds to Eve by saying, you will not surely die, but God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that's something that man has craved from the beginning. We get that from our forefather and mother Adam. Adam and Eve, this desire to be like God, this desire to be independent, to run the show, this desire to call the, sh to call the shots and to be the uh, captain of our fate and master of our soul. So he begins to waver. God appears to be holding out some good this from them. And this is one of the oldest tricks of our adversary, the Satan. Somehow make God look like the bad guy. Somehow make it look like our good God is not so good at all. So the woman saw the fruit of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden. She saw it and it was appealing. And the Bible calls that the lust of the eyes. She saw the tree was good for food. So it was desirable to make one wise. Oh, the pride of life by which we are so easily snared. So she took of that fruit and she gave it to her husband. Again, the lust of the flesh. Adam was also in on it because Adam was standing right there by her. He could have rebuked the adversary, Satan. He could have stopped Eve. He could have intervened, but he said nothing. With Eve, she was deceived, but Adam rebelled. Adam went in and yielded to the temptation that was being put forth by our adversary Satan. He entered in and said yes to that temptation with his eyes wide open. Immediately their world was turned upside down. They knew the change instantaneously. Their eyes indeed were open. They knew that they were naked. Their innocence was, van was gone. They were now ashamed of themselves and they were self-conscious and they had developed a new awareness, an awareness of evil and corruption, an awareness that was in their very soul. They needed to cover themselves up. And so in order to cover themselves up, they rushed around the garden and they found some fig leaves and hastily sold them together that they might have a covering to conceal their nakedness, to hide themselves. And then when God, the Creator, when he came down in the cool of the evening to talk with them, to be with them, to have fellowship with them, man and woman who previously had gone forth to meet the creator and enjoy time together, Instead, they ran and they hid themselves from the presence of God. And that's what we do when we are uncomfortable in the presence of God. When we are no longer comfortable in God's presence, we hide ourselves. We say, let me get away. Get away from his word. Get away from his people. Get away from anything that reminds us of his holiness, his purity. We run. We hide. Sin makes us hide ourselves from the God who loves us with an everlasting love. And the Lord God called out to Adam and said to him, Where art thou? And in our sin and in our rebellion and in our resistance, from the God who chooses to love us. God in his mercy still calls unto us. 
He calls us by name, calls us unto his grace, calls us into his mercies, calls us with kindness and with compassion. Where art thou? God is calling someone today, someone who's listening to this a message this morning or perhaps this evening. Like Jonah, you have chosen to run from God. You've heard the voice of God. You have heard the command of God. But you instead have determined that you are going to catch the boat and head to Tarshish. But God will find you in the boat. God will find you wherever you are at the bottom of the sea. God will rock your world because our God will release the hounds of heaven upon your trail because our God wants to draw you unto himself. The psalmist said it so very well. Where can we run where we can successfully hide from the presence of the Lord our God? Psalms 1 and 39 says, where can I go from your spirit? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Though I endeavor to hide in the darkness, it shall be light about me. Where can we hide? from the living God. What space is a space that our God does not know where we are? A space that is not known and revealed to the living and true God of heaven and earth. The man says to the God who's called out to him, where art thou? The man, Adam, says, I heard your voice and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God says to Adam, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that you were commanded not to eat from? Then the man begins what man does even today. Man begins the blame game. He says, it was that woman that you gave me. You know, I was fine all by myself. And then you introduce this companion, this woman, and look at what she has done. It was the woman that you gave me. He is, in so many words, pointing the finger at God as the source of his yielding to temptation and sin. And God then says to the woman, what is this that thou has done? And the woman has been deceived and disobeyed God. And she says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And that's the story of all mankind. We have been deceived and we have disobeyed our God. And because we have been deceived and disobeyed our God, we have brought chaos and confusion and disorder to our world. And yes, we need to answer the question, what is this that thou hast done? We've disobeyed our God. And because we have disobeyed our God, we live in a world that is suffering from an avalanche of sin and corruption. We're living in a world that's in rebellion against the true and living God. This is what we have done. We have disobeyed our God and evil and wickedness is having a seal day. Oh, our plight is dire. We are in a desperate situation. 
But praise be to God, there is some good news in this passage. God delivers to man in his corruption, in our failure, in our disobedience, and in the deception that Satan has introduced us to. God delivers a word of hope. God reveals to that serpent that he's going to crawl upon his belly and eat of the dust of the earth. Ultimately, he is going to be defeated. And Eve is going to bring forth children through pain and great suffering. And her desire is going to be to her husband. And Adam is going to learn that the ground is no longer going to cooperate. But there are going to be thistles and thorns to hinder his cultivation of the ground. And through the disobedience of man, of Adam and Eve, death has been introduced. No, they did not die immediately, but they died spiritually, instantaneously. Physically, they would continue to live, but spiritually they died. They were cut off, they were separated from the God who loves them the God who was their creator. They were dead spiritually because of their disobedience. They now no longer wanted to be in the presence of the living God. They no longer could enjoy that fellowship, that precious time together. They no longer wanted to commune with God, but instead they would hide themselves from the living God. But God in his grace and mercy, God says, Satan indeed has deceived man. But God says to Satan that man was going to bruise his head and crush his head even as he would bruise the heel of man. God was giving right then and there the good news of salvation, that God had a plan and that God's purposes would not be defeated even though Satan had deceived man and turned the world upside down. God had a plan through his son Christ Jesus that he would go to the cross and there in his body he would bear all of our sins and all of our iniquities and all of our corruption. He would die the death that we deserve to die so that we we might know the forgiveness of sin if we would trust him and believe on him and confess him as our Savior and Lord. Mankind would experience the redemption that God would make available to all who come to him by faith. The Bible says very clearly that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes, we had ruined things, but our God had a plan designed to draw us back into himself. Yes, when you consider the question, what is this that we had done? We introduced evil, sin, wickedness, corruption, violence into the world, but our God would not allow our disobedience to stop his wonderful plan, the plan of a great salvation, a plan that delivers all who trust in Christ as Savior and Lord. We can overcome because of the blood that was shed for us at Calvary. And that's why it's so good for us to gather around the table of communion on this very first Sunday in June and to be reminded of the price that was paid and the sacrifice that was made by our Lord who died in our place. We had done the crime, but he was willing to pay the price so that we might have the forgiveness of sin 
again and so that we might be restored to fellowship and peace with God. Oh, I pray today that if you do not know him, that you would come to him, that you would believe on him, that you would trust him as your Savior and Lord. Oh, how I would ask that you would bow with me this morning as you sense the Holy Spirit knocking at your heart's door and trust Christ even today to save you from your sin and to give you the assurance of eternal life. Please pray with me this morning. Our Father and our God, we bless your holy name. We thank you, Lord, that even though our sin was great and, gr and grievous and gross, that your grace was greater still, because in your grace and mercy, you gave your one and only Son, that if we're willing to say, I'm sorry for my sin, and if we're willing to open the door of our heart, that the Lord Jesus Christ will come in, and he will abide with within and give us the assurance of forgiveness and the right to the tree of life. Oh God, I pray today that somebody might trust you, that somebody might draw near to you, that we might realize that in this crooked world in which we live, filled with crises and chaos, that there is a way of escape. And it is through the Son who gave his life at Calvary. In Jesus' name, we pray and thank God. Amen. I want to invite you this morning to join with me in the sacrament of communion. Each first Sunday we gather together around this table where we're reminded of our Lord's suffering for us. And so I would invite you to come with me to Matthew chapter 26. And there we shall begin reading at verse 26. And you are invited to share with us today with the communion that you have prepared, a wafer, something to represent the body of our Lord broken for us, a cup, something to represent the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that was shed for us at Calvary. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now I ask that you would Pick up those elements that you have prepared this morning. Perhaps a cracker, a piece of bread, a wafer that is representative of our Lord's body, broken for us at Calvary. Eat you all of it. And then the cup, which represents our Lord's blood, the precious blood. The hymn writer said, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Take the cup and drink you all of it. And the Bible says that then they sung a hymn and they went out. We look forward to that first Sunday in July when we shall gather in this place as God wills and commune together in person. God bless you. Amen.